Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of What's Happening in Travel. Uh, welcome to episode 63. I am here with my buddy, Bushro, and I am Kerwin. And uh, here at What's Happening in Travel, we talk about, uh, <coughs> well, what's happening in travel. Uh, we basically look at the headlines for the, for the most past recent week. week, for the most part. The most part, yeah. Uh, but it, the cool thing with aviation is that a lot of this stuff, um, recent is, yeah, most of this stuff remains, remains current, uh, unless the yes. airlines go out and of for business. The, and today, the, today is the 16th of January, and we've really never run short of topics, even though it always seems like we will. We yeah. always have more than enough for at least one episode and yeah, one no, full no. episode. Yeah, and um, and uh, and at some point, we actually wanted to devote like an episode to diff aviation in different parts of the world, but there's so much going on, we haven't had a chance to do that just yet. <laughs> and so, Kisho, what's what's your background today? What you got there? Um, it's a Saudi triple seven taking off from. LAX with all the tales from all the different foreign airlines that typically come there. Oh yeah, I know. So I can see Eva in the early there. evening. Air Tahiti, Lufthansa, New Zealand, Eva, yeah. and then there's also Emirates and Air France. Ah, uh, there we go. So um, but, the the face of aviation is so different now, right? When you go to these airports, you don't see. Yeah. Well, you you probably see the planes, but they're parked, uh, not and not going anywhere. Um, have you flown Saudi? No. I flew them once. I still have it in that same uh, airplane behind you. I did JFK to Riyadh. Um, and uh, was it Riyadh? Oh, you had to go via Mecca, I remember. Yeah, it's Jeddah. Medina. Yeah, it's Jeddah yeah. I went. Yeah. Uh, and then coming back, I was going to go uh, via Riyadh, Dubai. It was Dubai, Mecca. Well, Dubai, yeah. Um, it was a biomaker rehab JFK and it didn't work because you need a, a visa, um, which the stupid online well, agency. Well, they've opened up. They've uh, opened up Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but at the time, uh, yeah, it wasn't yeah. possible, yeah, <clears throat> no. unfortunately. No. So it's quite the debacle. But the airline's actually a good airline. Uh, if I flew, you got your uh, money back, correct? Yes, I got only after I wrote uh, letters and letters. They didn't want to give mm. me my money back. And I had to write them a letter and then somebody called me up and they wouldn't admit that they were wrong. Mm. And they were because I actually talked to somebody who worked in the back end and they're like, yeah, they should not have shown me that fare mm. at all. Um, I like that color scheme as well. Yeah, yeah, it, it oh. is actually um, quite cool. And, and Saudi had just opened up um, for tourism. Saudi uh, Arabia, when, yes. Yeah, when yeah. Corona hit. Yeah, that's what I was to mention, yeah. Yeah, so it'll be interesting um, what's going to happen after. Yeah. And uh, I've got a JetBlue, I think it's a 321. Yeah, 321. Yeah, JetBlue 321. Um, CEO, from what I can guess. What's that? A CEO. It's not the any or the Neo. Oh, okay. So that's the regular one. Yeah, yeah, you can tell by the size of the engine. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was at JFK and I was heading to Barbados <laughs> at the time. And oh. um, this airplane showed up. I, I, I think that was actually our airplane that went to, went to Barbados. Mm. Um, all right. So what's our first topic? All right. Our first topic is um, we talked about the uh, ARJ-21, which is the original jet being developed by China before. And um, we didn't think the program was going to go anywhere, go anywhere. But what's, yeah but what's going on now <laughs> so yeah we did talk about this not that long ago yeah uh, actually on multiple occasions mm -hmm. um this is really um a dc9 uh, ripoff by comac the chinese aviation manufacturing company one yeah. of them and um airlines were essentially made to buy this aircraft, even though they may not have needed it or wanted it. Uh, but um, in fact, um, a China Eastern subsidiary called OTT, which apparently stands for one, two, three, they recently <laughs> started service with it. Yeah. Um, and the reason I mentioned this this week is that Comac got its first international order 
for this ARJ-21 aircraft Who's that? from an Indonesian carrier called Transnusa. This is a small, tiny little airline um, that is based out of um, Kupang, which is on the island of Timor in um, uh, where Eastern Indonesia. Ah, okay. And they currently operate um, a small fleet of ATRs, uh, four aircraft and one um, uh, BAE 146. They're, they're a regional airline. Yeah. And they sort of have a livery that is very reminiscent of uh, Batik Air, mm -hmm. which um, essentially has the Batik motif on its tail, but that's beside the point. So they have ordered, um, they have leased actually uh, 30 aircraft that are to be delivered by 2028. Uh, okay. So, and as I mentioned, this is sort of momentous because it's the first order by an airline outside of China mm -hmm. to do this. Now, um, it reached this agreement through a leasing company that is, of course, based in China. And this was deal was signed on January 8th. Uh, this oh. is an airline that was, was formed in 2005. Um, and this aircraft, the ARJ-21, started service in 2016, but they had a lot of uh, manufacturing issues. And 46 of the type are in operation throughout China. Now, it's to be seen if this meets the same fate as the Sukhoi Superjet from Russia. Yeah. Poor experience that um, Interjet in Mexico has had with that aircraft. So hopefully, China has learned from this experience of Sukhoi <coughs> and the aircraft is reliable and that they can get, Transnusa can get the support it needs um, to efficiently operate this new type. Yeah, because so. I guess that's the interesting thing, right? When you get these new planes, um you do have to make sure that you get you get the support that, that they yes have. because that is super super important and that's yeah. where boeing and airbus are excellent at and the russians and so far the chinese have failed miserably at this is not an easy thing to do no it's not at all uh, to have worldwide spares and support available yeah and i guess that's when you're when people always talk about you know boeing going out of business you're like Mm, no, it's gonna happen. <laughs> you know, a, a, a lot of the a lot of the world flies on Boeing. Yeah, same thing for Airbus. You know, yeah, I, a large amount of the world um, flies on Airbus and Boeing. Um, all right. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see that you know at least something good is happening on their end. Um, now, one of the things that you know <laughs> when it comes to aircraft that we talk about is. Um, Nobody seemed to care, but so the airline industry started with cargo and then they're like, okay, fine, let's, let's take some passengers. Um, COVID happened and we were like, okay, we can't really take passengers, but we got to take cargo. Um, Cause I don't think people realize that for you to get that phone, it's not made in the country where you are usually, unless you're in China and it says usually shipped to you. You know, when you buy a computer, they assemble it in another country and then it's shipped to you at some point. And that usually comes by airplanes. And so um, one of the companies- But it's not just phones, right? It's flowers, it's everything. It's everything, right? Yeah, so uh, Atlas Air is one of the um, cargo airlines that you guys don't really care about, um, but they're a huge cargo carrier. And so, um, and they fly those 747s that are being parked. So what's going on? What's going on with Atlas and the 747s? So this was sort of a, a, a sad, but a good story, uh -huh. if that makes any sense. Yeah. So what Atlas did is that they finally put in an order for the last four Boeing 747-8 on the flight assembly line. At oh. Seattle. Uh -huh. So they cite the growing cargo demand, especially as e-commerce and the express sectors uh, jump due to this pandemic. Yeah. So um, Atlas is an airline that was formed 28 years ago with one 747 and now has um, Polar um, and Southern Airways as their subsidiaries in addition to Atlas. 
Okay. They all have different liveries. Yeah. And they are currently the largest operator of the 747. Um, I believe they have 53 of them. Mm -hmm. That includes the, the Dash 8 freighter, the Dash 400 freighter, and the converted freighter of the 747. Ah, uh, okay. Um, they chose it mainly for its capacity and its nose loading capability because that's the only real commercial freighter in common use that has this ability to carry oversized items through uh, the opening of the nose of the aircraft. Right. Um, also, it's about 16% more fuel efficient and uh, better in operating costs by about 16% per ton per mile than um, the 747-400. And it's also 25% um, more voluminous than a 777. 200 freighter. Oh, okay. So they, this is these are the last 747s to roll off the Boeing assembly line, and they expect delivery uh, between May and October 2022. So it's really not that far away. Right, right. Um, and um, although Atlas is the largest operator of the 747, UPS, United Parcel Service, is the largest operator of the 747-8F. They have um, 20 in service and they have nine more to be delivered. Ah, okay. And this sort of made the news on CNN because it was such a, a, a significant a milestone. Okay. Gotcha. Because after this, the 747 is no more. I believe even if airlines wanted it, they couldn't get it because um, Boeing has shut down uh, sub assemblies or the, the other companies who provide Boeing with sub assemblies have shut down. That's so crazy. So, um, a shame, as, but. Yeah, as you say, the sub assembly, um, and I guess this is related to this. The, and you were talking about how the nose opens up and the stuff goes in. But with the 747 Combi, which is the ones that have a passenger and a cargo on, yeah. the same, on the same deck. Um, when the back opens up, it's big enough to take a car. Yeah. Um, so what did you know? Actually. Yeah, on the side, right? Do you know where um, those 747s are going? KLM, as I remember, was one of the few carriers in the world that had it. Yeah. I really don't know of any other airline that flew it, the, the Combi, the 400 Combi. Yeah, I don't know if any other either. But do you know, you know where theirs no, are going? No, I do to? not. They're know. retiring them, right? They've gone. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. So I'm assuming that they'd probably go to some um some one of these, maybe Kalita or one of those God knows. or something. God knows. Yeah. Yeah. We need to we need to look at that. Um but no, this is that's 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 cool. Um yeah. Atlas flies in and out of here all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah, we see them every time coming out of here. In Houston, yes. Yep. Um so. all right. So our next story has to do with Boeing. Boeing is always in the news, right? It's like, I think we have more stories. But we're, mostly we're not in a good way, unfortunately. Yeah. They're uh, such an incredible company, but they've been laid low yeah. by some of their stupid practices. Yep. Well, you know, it's, it's these cost cutting and um, trying to satisfy the shareholders and things <clears> like that that cause a lot of problems. So, um, and now they're in trouble with the... Department of Justice. Yes. So on January 7th, uh, the Department of Justice in the US fined Boeing uh, $2.5 billion for, as they say, hiding information from investigators probing the crashes of the 737 MAX aircraft. Yeah. Um, Boeing employees concealed details from the Federal Aviation Administration here in the US investigating these crashes. Um, and uh, this fine is because the FAA exposed, as they said, fraudulent and deceptive conduct by employees. Wow. Uh, Boeing employees, again, quote, chose the path of profit over candor by concealing information from the FAA concerning the operation of its 737 MAX airplanes yeah. and engaging in an effort to cover up their deception. 
So uh, this is three parts. The, this 2.5 billion is based on three parts. The first one is for its um, employees' um, criminal conduct. The second part addresses the financial impact to Boeing's airline customers. Mm -hmm. And the third one is to hopefully provide some measure of compensation to the crash victims, families, and beneficiaries. Uh, so of this 2.5 billion, 243 million goes into criminal penalties to Boeing. $500 million goes to the families um, who lost relatives in the crashes. Okay. And about 1.8 billion to global airlines um, affected by the subsequent grounding of this plane. So the Boeing CEO, who's, uh, his name is Dave Calhoun, he said he was in agreement with the uh, fine uh, and paying it by Boeing was the right thing to do uh, and acknowledged the firm's wrongdoing. Uh, he went on to say how we, as in Boeing, fell short of our values and expectations. And this fine was a serious reminder to us all of how critical our obligation of transparency to regulators is and the consequences that our company will face if any of us fall short of those expectations. Okay. It all sounds very humble and nice. But um, yeah, I guess at some point they have to, right? They have to. They had yeah. to. Yes. They had to. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, you can say the the lawyer made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer probably did. <laughs> yeah. Right to, to send um, this away. Yeah, so. I, it's it's one of those things because they've had so many issues. So it's like, okay, great. Uh, let's just let this one go away. Yeah, but um, can you imagine writing a stroke in a check for how about two point two point two billion two point five billion? Actually, yeah, but does that just go to like the um, the insurance company? <laughs> oh lord! Um, all right, some good news coming out of the aircraft section. Um, we talked about this before the um, the Airbus A three twenty one LR, which uh, yes. stands for long range, and um, they had set a record for world distance uh, for for distance a distance record. Yes, a commercial and a commercial, commercial distance. And, and what have they what have they done again? So um, we talked about this, I think, um, early in earlier this in twenty twenty. Uh huh. Uh, so in no, actually it was later in 2020. In October of last year, yeah, Air Transat, which is an airline based in Canada, they operated uh, the longest ever commercial flight by an Airbus 321 using the LR aircraft from Montreal right. to Athens. Now, the all-time record was set by Airbus itself uh, from the Seychelles to Toulouse. Mm -hmm. um, but that really didn't count because it was part of, part of the testing and therefore could not be considered as a commercial flight. Oh, okay. So um, on January 3rd, this very unlikely airline called Azores Airlines, which is was, was called SATA. Right, right. I know in that. In Punta Delgata, in the Azores, in the North Atlantic. Uh -huh. uh, they flew nine hours and 49 minutes from Lisbon to Bogota in Colombia. Wow. So that broke the uh, eight hour, 20 minute record for uh, Montreal Athens. Did they have people on it? Yes, they did. It, they are, they, because this is not normally a route that uh, uh, Azores flies because they really don't do transatlantic. They do uh, Punta Delgada to Bermuda, but that's not strictly speaking transatlantic. Right, and, and, they, and they do, they do put the regard to Boston too. Right, again, not strictly speaking transatlantic because the Azores are sort of so in the middle of So they start in their land, yeah. Yes, but this one was probably a charter. Azores didn't really make, make clear, but it was with passengers. And then the second longest flight was the return Bogota-Lisbon flight, yeah, uh, which clocked in at nine hours and 20. Um, yeah. They currently have seven uh, um, 321s, and two of them 
LR, the LR version. But um, as I said, this aircraft is going to change transatlantic dynamics, flight dynamics, just like the 757 did yeah. 20 plus years ago. Star so, Boeing. <laughs> yep, Boeing dragged its feet on the uh, basement and now they're probably paying the price or will pay the price because yeah. this is really not in widespread service. But um, a lot of US airlines have placed orders for this Airbus version of the 321. Yeah, that's interesting. So that is actually pretty amazing news when you think about it. Um, yeah. yeah, that's cool. I, I'm, I'm glad that other, you know, cool stuff is happening. Because like we talked about uh, JetBlue getting their A220 last week. So yes. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, cool things are happening. Um, even during the pandemic. Uh, oh. All right, so now we have a bunch of little news and um, uh, just like kind of the kind of miscellaneous aviation news. Um, and the first one is, so uh, if you travel with Kusho, Kusho is always eating when he flies. And so he always goes and find all these food stories. <laughs> and this one is quite good. <laughs> so he found I know. One about a Japan Rail Cafe um and japan airlines what are they doing so i didn't know this existed uh -huh. but um it's apparently um according to the mothership which i'd never heard of but the japan rail cafe is the world's first and only travel themed cafe okay again someone will have to uh, prove that but uh that's what they claim and i believe it so they have um Two, um, no, there's more travel theme cafe. They is have, it? They, there's one in LA. There's a, there's a restaurant right next to LAX that has a whole bunch of airplanes and stuff in it. No, but that doesn't count, right? It has to actually resemble an, uh, something an to do with an aircraft or whatever. There's and one, this there's apparently... One Martin. Is there? Yeah, there's an airplane. It's actually a green one. And inside it is a restaurant. But it's not a chain, is it? It's, it's a uh, one-off. It's not a chain. Right. So, this is a chain. So, and uh, so the fine, Japan Rail fine. Cafe uh -huh. has the ambience of Japan Railways. Okay. They have a location in Tokyo, in Taipei, in Taiwan, and the third location in Singapore. It's in the Tanjong Pagar area, yeah, the, okay. the MRT stop, if you're interested. And so what they did is that they recently announced a collaboration with Japan Airlines to bring selected in-flight menu items to their uh, uh, menu, item, menu choices in this Japan uh, rail cafe. Yeah. It, it's all catered by SATS, which is the... Uh, Singapore Airlines uh, um, agency that caters Japan Airlines flights from Singapore. Uh, we talked about and that a few weeks ago, right? That company? Not the rail cafe. No, no, we did talk about that. Company, yes. That, so. Yes. Yes. Um, so the, the locations apparently have the ambience of Japan Railways. And I'm not exactly sure what it means. I saw pictures of it. It doesn't particularly strike me as being reminiscent of uh, the trains in Japan, but yeah. I am not an expert on that. But anyway, so what they have is um, uh, rice plates. They have a donburi, which is a rice bowl. Mm -hmm. They have salad, sweets, snacks, beer, and drinks. And they range in price from about uh, four US dollars for drinks to about... Uh, 14 US dollars for rice plates. Well, that's not too but bad. what is even more interesting that all diners who order these items get discounts, which can go as high as 28% off um, flights on Japan Airlines from Singapore to Japan. Yeah. I find it hard to believe they would distribute a lot of these high discount certificates to uh, diners, but who knows? Maybe they do. Um, it's served, the meal is served on a Japan Airlines onboard aircraft trays, includes a main, two appetizers, and a dessert. And uh, 
It is more expensive than traditional fast food, but as they say, it's the experience and the ambience that you're paying for. Uh, Japan Airlines merchandise is also available. For instance, a model plane uh, of the 787 is uh, 26 US dollars, which is not outrageous, but it's yeah. that's pretty normal. standard. Yeah, so it's Singapore dollars 34. And what is interesting is that on weekends, uh, Japan Airlines Singapore based crew are present uh, to share knowledge of what is called furoshiki wrappings, which is a Japanese uh, style of wrapping items in cloth, typically cotton and or silk. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, apart from the airplane models, they do have a lot of Japanese centric novelty items for sale in this rail cafe. And I say hats off to them for doing this. Now, now I it, want to go. I, mean, I know, where is it located? It's in this area called Tanjong Pagar, which is an MRT station in central Singapore. Um, it's, the address is on 5 Wallach Street hmm. uh, in the Guoko Tower. Smack dab in the middle of Singapore. Oh, wow. Okay. So, yeah, we're definitely pricey for me, but I'd be willing to splurge for one occasion. Yeah, I know. I mean, plus it would make a good story, right? I mean, yeah. since we've talked about all these stories, we have so much catching up to do. And we yeah, and so much talk. eating to do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and all in Southeast Asia. Uh, well, well, the good thing is that, you know, Asian food doesn't make you fat. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, all right. Uh, uh, you know, maybe we should have had the food story as the last story, because huh? that would have been such a now nice way to I know, right? Um, because JL food is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really, I haven't played them in a while, but yeah. Um, all right, so we have four stories to go, and all four of them are terrible. Um, I, I forgot that we should have, uh, so I'm going to try, I'm going to switch them around a little bit, Kusha, so we have the most, so huh. we have the least terrible one at the end. Um, oh, the, none of them qualify now. <laughs> so we're going to go with um, more Boeing doom and gloom story. Um, I, I, I personally think they just want to get out of Seattle for whatever reason, but tell me what's happening. Now. What are they doing now? So this was in the Seattle Times newspaper. And I, it, to me, it seems like a huge mistake, but what do I know? Yeah. So uh, Boeing has this um, manufacturing research and development center across the road from the Museum of Flight in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's called the Advanced Developmental Composites Building. It's huge. It takes up like, yes. the entire- It's got airport. no windows. Um, and it is closing in the next four to six months. Mm -hmm. um, they expanded it about 10 years ago um, after the debacle that they experienced with getting the 787 manufacturing spread out all over the world, which right. was an, not a great success, at least initially. But what it is, more importantly, it is a hub for future innovation for in-house manufacturing capabilities. Um, it's a relatively small workforce, workforce most working on the most important and secretive and revolutionary uh, manufacturing research projects, both military and commercial. For instance, they made critical, critical pieces of the, the Boeing B-2 bomber in the mm -hmm. 80s and the 90s, the F-22 fighter wings, and more applicable to us are the wings of the 787 and the uh, 777X, uh, given that they're all composite. Yeah. So this facility has these two huge... Um, autoclaves essentially, which are high pressure ovens that bake these carbon composites into uh, hard materials. So they've been doing a lot of work very quietly behind the scenes without a lot of fanfare and um, mostly with to do with composite pieces. And it's been part of Boeing's drive. The shutdown is part of Boeing's drive to sharply reduce its real estate holdings 
amid an unprecedented downturn in its business. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, what they did is that they really downplayed the significance of this closing. First, they thought that the analysts thought that this was, as you mentioned, a way of for Boeing to slowly but surely move out of Washington. Mm-hmm. But Boeing insists that almost all of this work will stay in state, but will be distributed to other locations in uh, the Puget Sound area, which is where Seattle is. Right. right. Um, the building will not be sold. So uh, I don't understand the, the rationale for lowering their real estate footprint. Uh, yeah, it it's like... closed and left empty for now with no plans for the future. So, I don't believe all that because that, that, that makes sense to the people who, who wrote the, the, um, the thing, article, the article, yeah. but that doesn't make any, but think about it. If you're trying to s- decrease your real estate footprint, why would you close the building and still leave it there? Because it's smack in the middle of other Boeing facilities, exactly. which begs the question, yes. why would you even close it? Yes. If it's that crucial. Yes. So that doesn't make any, because it, it's part of, I mean, across from that entire area is all Boeing buildings. Yeah. Um, so uh, I hope they don't stop the work. I doubt they will because they yeah, cannot yeah. afford to stop. They will. Yeah. But, why, not, uh, why not, excuse me, why not just come clean, right? And tell us what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> that would make too much sense. Because then, because then we speculate, right? Because we're like, yeah, oh, yeah. You close the building. It's in the middle of your other properties. You're just going to close it. So, are you just trying to um, cut down on what you're? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's yeah. But hopefully, Boeing has learned its lesson and turned the corner. I don't know on its misdeeds. Yeah. Well, you, well, you know, Kusha. Then, yeah, you and I are never going to get hired now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> Shocked indeed. Um, oh. All right. So uh, closing, closing, closing. So we've talked about this in the previous episode a lot, um, but we haven't really, you know, given you the four one one on it. Um, with COVID nineteen going nuts in the in the U.S. and people just not <laughs> adhering to requirements and the US being accused of being lax anyway in a lot of things that they're doing in terms of COVID-19, um, they're gonna do something really radical come in about uh, next January, week. Next week, yeah. yeah the January they're going 20th. to come in line with most countries in the world yeah. and require a negative COVID test, um, mostly PCR, um, before, anybody enters the US from any foreign origin. Yeah. So um, it's <laughs> anyone over the age of two, that is starting on January 26th. <clears throat> anyone who is positive, this is an odd one that I didn't realize. Anyone who has been tested positive in the past three months is exempt because you have sort of medium term immunity. Yeah, you just have to have proof. Yes, you do have to have proof of yeah. the positive test. Uh-huh. And if you've been vaccinated, you still have to take a COVID test because you can be asymptomatic. Because yeah. you haven't figured out a vaccination test. Right. So it could be the antigen test, which is the, uh, the rapid test, which gives you results in 15 to 30 minutes or whatever, or the PCR test. They should be specified, actually. I think it uh, is specified the, on the CDC's website. Okay, because here they say, uh, this is on multiple, this is in Airways, in, on the Associated Press and CNBC. They specified either or, which doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Because okay. one, um, the PCR is more accurate than the antigen. So one of the things so, with, the, with these items is, <laughs> uh, sorry, go ahead, Krisha. The antibody test, which really says that you've had the virus mm-hmm. in the past, is not valid. And uh, as a standard with almost all countries, the test has to be taken um, within 72 hours of departure. So the US has been requiring this for all passengers coming from the UK and Ireland in December, 2020. Um, 
and there is still a current ban on all non-residents from Schengen countries, that is the EU mostly, including the UK, Ireland, uh, Brazil, and China since March 2020. So hopefully this will help a little bit, but given all the issues with the testing, um, I'm glad they at least they did something, even yeah. though it's going to be really expensive for us travelers. It's going to be expensive. And as a, as a non-rev, um, yes. you can't be doing these. It's not going to happen. You won't be able to do all these quick trips anymore. That's right. Because you need... Um, uh, <laughs> all right, Krisho. So here's a, here's a, here's a question. <laughs> yes. And it, it's a non-rev question, right? So the rule says, uh, I'm just reading it from the CDC's website. It says, of course, you know, they have a nine page rule to tell you that huh. this is what it is, but um, they've co um, condensed it. It requires all passengers arriving to the US from a foreign country to get tested for COVID-19 infection no more than three days before their flight departs and to provide proof of the negative results or documentation of having recovered from COVID-19 to the airline before boarding the flight. So, non-revs, we take weekend trips. Not anymore. We well, won't. well, but think about this one, right? So if if I, uh, it doesn't. I assume that a test should be done in the other country, but yes. it doesn't really specifically say that. So I leave the U.S. today. I took I took a test, and I got my results. I did the fast test, and I got the results. And I go to London and I, or I go to someplace in the same time zone. Let's say I go to Mexico. Uh, and, then I, and then I come back and I use that same test that I already took. It's only three days old. Good point. <laughs> and this is the thing, right? Whenever they make these rules, I don't think they think it all the way through um, because they need to make sure they think all this stuff all the way through because people are going to come up with these harebrained schemes and go like, well, you didn't tell me I have to do it in the same country. Um, so that's going to be interesting how that, how that works. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's going to have a lot of people possibly stranded uh, overseas. Yes. <clears throat> and all these non-revs who are doing like turns, you know, because they're, yeah. they're taking something to their family in another country. And they're just meeting them at the airport and coming right back. What happens to these? You you probably won't yeah. be able to do that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I mean, and I know that these are exceptions. And the thing is, you probably find out at the airport on your way back, which is too yeah. late. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and and what people have to realize though, Krisha, is that if you travel and you get sick, so let's say you're positive, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're screwed. Gonna, Right, you're gonna to have to figure out how am I gonna take care of myself medically uh, until I can get a negative test done in a foreign country. In a foreign but country, you don't know the. So this is like a two-week thing, you know. If I go to yep. somewhere, else, it doesn't matter where it is, and some countries don't have um, the health the health facilities are not really there. Mm -hmm. um, some place, like I was trying to look up. So, for example, somebody said they were going to Brazil, and I was just searching on the uh on brazil to find out well where can i go get a COVID test in brazil and i couldn't find the information so it's kind of like you need to determine before you go uh where can i go to get my COVID yeah. test you probably even have to make an appointment to get the COVID yep. test done depending on where you are and i saw in some places they uh and i think it was actually brazil but this is earlier last year where they had all the tests but they didn't have the things to process them. So they couldn't get the results back out to the people. So you really have to check, um, mm. <clears throat> check, you know, are you gonna be overwhelming yep. somebody else's healthcare system uh, in trying to wait for a test? And I guarantee you're gonna have people, you know, moaning yeah. about they can't get their test to come Because this there. really is a significant change. It is a significant so, change. Especially for people going to the Caribbean. Region. Yeah. I've actually seen some people canceling their trips to the Caribbean because um, it takes four days to get a test back. And it's probably more expensive uh -huh. at these smaller country locations. 
Yep. So I've seen people canceling their trips uh, as a oh. result. Um, all right. So if you've ever gone through an airport and see those TVs in the airport, um, and it's always CNN, right? They're yeah. always talking about- This is only in the US, by the way. Right, only in the US. The it's airport network from CNN yep. well, is only in the US. <clears throat> But and they're gone now. <laughs> they're gone. Well, they but will be gone. Will be yeah. as of March thirty uh, first. Actually, April first. Yeah. Uh, I actually do watch the channel. But well, you're a CNN um, guy anyway, right? You always yeah. watch CNN and BBC. <laughs> yeah. But it they have very interesting um, stories, and it yeah. keeps you occupied because I don't look at my phone all the time. And they have some interesting stories, but um, again, this will have limited um, relevance to people outside the US because this is a domestic a change only. So CNN has this uh, airport network uh, that has been operating for 30 years and they've decided to close it. The first reason is being the decrease in people at the airports and the second one being that people now consume their media from different sources. So the way it works, <laughs> yes. So the way it works is that CN, CNN paid the airports to exclusively provide the content and then made money off the advertising. Right. Um, and of course that doesn't make sense anymore. So this is a channel that's available 24 seven. And believe me, that's true, especially if you've had to spend the night as in as many airports as I have. <laughs> and it's at 58 US airports at about 2,400 gates within an airport. Yeah. Uh, does not include airport lounges. Um, Thank so God. Because those typically play the regular CNN programming. Yeah. But um, this was developed with a very a different guideline for content. Um, they did an analysis and they found that the differences from regular CNN versus the airport network, that the airport network was 48% um, lifestyle and entertainment based, 16% live news, 17% business headlines and 19% sports. Hmm. And they also have absolutely no discussion of commercial plane crashes on the network and almost no political content. Yeah. So I want to know what they're going to do with all those monitors. I know, I was just going to say, uh, you know, no. what are they going to, uh, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they have on them now. Unless they play regular CNN. Uh, well, I guess it's the airport. Which wouldn't can, be a bad thing. Yeah, they could play whatever they want, right? So yeah, yeah. So they could, yeah, they could definitely do. I that don't know who pays control. for the monitors, though. Is it CNN or the airport? Um, that's a good question because I forgot where I was. Um, oh, I was in Legaspi in Manila, and mm. um, they were swapping out the monitors, <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was LG monitors. And the guy, I said, well, you know, who are these monitors coming from? He's like, well, they came from the, the, the company that makes them, which was LG. And so that's how the airport was getting it. So the okay. monitors might just be paid for by- Maybe, uh, yeah. <clears throat> from the companies that make them, which yeah. makes sense, right? Because if you see the TV and you like it, you're like, oh yeah, I want to have one like that. Mm. And then you go buy that. So it's really advertising for, the, um, so. for that. So that's interesting. So- no more airport network on CNN. Yeah. And they'll probably yeah. pipe in a local station or something like that. Uh, but then the, the whole the whole idea was you wouldn't see anything about a plane crash. Yeah. Or yeah. I don't want to really know about a murder in wherever. Yeah. Although, you know, they say that, but I'm trying to think. I've seen them talk about plane crashes in the airport. Have you? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Well, I'm sure well, not on CNN. <clears throat> Yeah, maybe maybe it was a local airport that switched the station or something. Oh. Um, yeah, I think what was the um, what was the plane? Oh, it was it was a JetBlue flight where they had some issues, and then the people were watching it on live TV 
on the season. Oh, is that the one with the nose gear that was bent? Yes. Or done in one. Los Angeles, I believe yeah. it was. And so they were watching that, but I think eventually they turned it off. <laughs> okay. That would that, aggravate me. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to die. Look, I'm going to die. <laughs> so if they cut off coverage. Yeah. But, uh, so. good Lord. All right. Let's talk about sanctions. Um, the U.S. and the China and and the China U.S. and China um, yes are are not good trade partners. Um, so what's going on? Of course, but this was announced yes. just yesterday. In fact, yeah, um, just a few days before the new U.S. administration under Biden comes into effect. Yeah, and uh, the current government announced that the uh, uh, Department of Defense. Had, have, has added COMAC and AVIC, which are the two Chinese um, aviation conglomerates, mm -hmm. um, to a list of um, six other Chinese companies that allegedly contribute advanced technologies to China's effect, efforts to modernize its militaries. Um, AVIC is... Um, a company that produces this MA-700 turboprop aircraft in China, that again, is an ATR ripoff. <laughs> um, I, I guess I shouldn't say ripoff, but it looks suspiciously like an ATR. There you go. Um, this comes, as I said, just days before the new uh, Biden administration comes into government, and it bans Americans from investing in Chinese firms, armed owned or deemed controlled by the Chinese military, of which AVIC and um, COMAC are now lumped. Uh, so it requires UN, US investors to withdraw holdings by November 11th of this year. And the bigger deal is that this threatens the viability of the Chinese C919, which is the uh, narrow body right. uh, that's supposed to compete against the Airbus 320 family and the Boeing 737 family, um, and the ARJ21, which is oh, this regional DC-9 knockoff. That's the one that we just talked about, right? Yes. Given that the engines and avionics are US uh, manufactured, mm -hmm. CFM, which makes the engines for the Airbus and uh, Boeing products, and GE, that does it for the ARJ, provide the engine and Collins Aerospace and Honeywell supply the avionics and flight controls. Okay. So um, I haven't heard any further news, but this is probably, or it sounds like a death knell for these aircraft. I doubt China can really substitute other parts so quickly, but um, I guess they will wait and see what Biden decides to do if he decides to revoke these sanctions or not. Yeah, that'll be interesting. <clears throat> but it's more drama uh, yeah. in this period. That's really not quite necessary. But um, are Boeing, are parts, are Boeing parts also made in China? Um, the yes, they are, right? Yeah, I think so, right? But the technology is American. <clears throat> yeah. You know, so. I mean, look at this issue with cars. Because the little uh, chips, the semiconductor chips that are, mm -hmm. are used, ubiquitous in modern cars, um, are in short supply because of these sanctions. And uh, a lot of U.S. car manufacturers have had to cut back production because there are oh. just not enough. Ah, interesting. So it works both ways. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, to see what happens. Um... Not much we can do about it, but just wait. Yep. Wait and see. All right. So I guess uh, we started with uh, aviation and politics and we ended with aviation and politics. <laughs> um, that's all we have um, for, the, for this so, episode. Um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see um, how... Um, uh, who is the transportation secretary? Are they... they Currently, it, it was Elaine Chow. Right, and she she left. She resigned. Yes. Yeah, she's resigned. But who's the who's the new person supposed to be? Uh, Pete Buttigieg. 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. So th th do they have to, <coughs> is that one appointed or do they have to like? No, Senate confirmation. That confirmed by the legislative branch. Yes, so I guess we'll wait to see. It's cabinet uh, level. Yeah, we'll wait to see what's going to happen with yeah. uh, American aviation once we, we get another. Yeah. So but currently we have no potentially a big deal. We have no transportation minister. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have, have no. Um, Elaine Chow. We have hardly any cabinet left, right? Yeah. Uh, Elaine Chow, she was at. Um, uh, she was at CES last year. Okay. Yeah, um, and so was um, she did a speech. Uh, actually, a really, really good speech about uh, aviation and things like that. And then mm. we also had, um, so of course, it's aviation. She's transportation secretary. Um, and we had uh, what's his name? Uh, Bastian. Ed from Delta. Ed Bastian, yeah, from Delta. He was mm -hmm. he was talking about all the cool Delta. Isn't the CES going on right now online? It, it finished. Oh, uh, it's, okay. Yeah, it was from the 11th to the 14th. Uh, okay. It was very disappointing. <clears throat> what a uh, huge blow to Las Vegas, though, financially. Yeah, it, oh, financially, it's huge. Um, uh, but to my, I don't want to get sidetracked here. No, 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 it's okay. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's related, right? Uh, to my pocket, it was actually really good because I didn't have to buy a flight. I didn't have to do hotels. <laughs> um, so in, in case no one knows what the heck we're talking about, CES is the... Is the so. The, the, the brand name is CES. What it is, is a consumer electronic show. Um, you're kind of barred from saying that one represents the other. So which is why I kind of said it like that. Um, and it's the, it's held in Las Vegas every year in January. And it's held usually like about four or five days. It's like an entire week thing. And remind me why we're talking about this on an airline. Um, oh, because it's, it's related because Delta was there last year and okay. also it's related to the industry because no one traveled. So this year it was virtual, like a lot of different conferences. And so um, <clears throat> in Las Vegas on the billboards at the hotels, they had signs up that said, see, yes, we miss you or something like that um, because uh, nobody was going out there. And that's mm. a huge part of the, um, the travel. Economy, right? Yeah, because the airlines make a lot of money because yep. a lot of people come from Asia, um, a lot from, from China. Uh, all the announcements for all the TVs and the big screen TVs and all yeah. the home stuff is usually made at CES every year, which they made this year, but they did, they did it virtual. Um, so, uh, you know, it affects the aviation industry because there were no flights. And also what they were thinking was that last year, um, some people were complaining about not feeling well during CES. And um, they kind of traced some people back in, back to having okay. what they thought was COVID um, back at the time. And I was mm -hmm. at CES, so I don't know, uh, because I was never, yeah. we didn't have any tests or anything like that. But people were, this, people were sick and they couldn't explain why they were sick. Mm -hmm. um, so, so anyway, that's it for this week. That's all we have. Uh, thank you very much for watching um, and listening. Uh, this has been another episode of What's Happening in Travel, episode uh, 63. And um, uh, with my buddy, Bushro. And I am Kerwin, and we are signing off. Talk to you guys soon. Uh,